Okay, Renette Senem is here. Yeah. Woo! What can I say? What an honor to have you with us here today at our meet and greet. Renette is the common ground candidate. What other gubernatorial candidate has bodily autonomy on their platform? Honestly, really. Uh, Renette's the former mayor and council member of Nevada City. And did you know that she was the first woman to cross Alaska alone in 1994? And she filmed the endeavor for National Geographic. And she can tell you about that some other time. But uh, wow, I'm just so honored to have you here with us. And take it away, Renette Senna. <laughs> Day, I heard the clouds parted for this event. <laughs> um, first of all, Monique, thank you so very much. Thank you for opening your home. It's just so beautiful. Yes. And all your hard work, and Marsha as well, and all the volunteers. I've done a lot of events, and I know this takes a lot more work than you realize. There's a lot behind it. So hi, everyone. It's so beautiful to see all of you. I've been so looking forward to this, and I did not realize we are going to be on the water. So my name is Renette Senum. I want to say thank you to all the volunteers and everyone who's helped this. I want to say thank you to my partner, Susan, who helped this campaign come on the alley without her. Led up a uh, gubernatorial campaign. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to take us all on a little bit of journey, and I'm going to land us all right here where we are now, and I'm going to let you know where we can actually go. And um, as much as I know we've been going through about two years of very much darkness, uh, there's, a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and we're seeing it, and we're moving closely to it. So um, I'm going to kind of go back and go forward a little bit in time, back and forth. So uh, more recently, uh, I am from Nevada City, California. A little northern California town in, in, in the, by past Sacramento, by Lake Tahoe, in the gold country. I was born in San Francisco, and then when I was four years old, my parents moved me up to, to Nevada Ca County, California. And, uh, and I was raised by a hardworking registered nurse and a Teamster truck driver, and they gave me a really good work ethic at a, at a young age. I learned how to like lay a concrete slab by the time that I was eight, and I hated that I knew that. Because <laughs> I really just want to go play with my friends. And now I'm very grateful, because now I know how to work and I'm working for a better planet. So um, to let you all know, um, I'm gonna tell you some personal story and I'm gonna try to keep it as truncated as possible because it's important for you to know this part of the personal story because it's very much in this campaign. This campaign has been a long, long, long time in the making. And so as I said, I was born in San Francisco, adopted at two months old, and then when I was 11 years old, I actually actively started to look for my parents, my mother. And I went off to adoption research organizations. They all said, ah. You know, we, we can't help you till you're 18, and, and basically you have plenty of time, your mother's young, you're young, don't worry. Um, so, did not know until 20 years later she was actually sick and she would die about that time. And then my adoptive mother would also die when I was 19 years old with cancer. And she was a very, very hardworking registered nurse. And she was working to actually start living at the age of 55, and she missed it by a year. And that was a really incredible lesson to have at that age. And so I've been traveling around the world, and I ultimately traveled around 60 countries, and I joined a South Pole expedition, I trained with them, but I couldn't raise the money, so they went to the South Pole without me, and then I organized my own American Women's Trans-Antarctic Expedition. In my mid-20s, they're like, Renette, we've been doing this for 20 years, you're just starting, so they kicked me off the team, and they went to the South Pole without me. <laughs> and by this time, I've been looking for my family, looking for my family, and I could not find them. They just seemed to have disappeared. So I thought, you're never gonna find them. So what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to go out there, and you're gonna test yourself, and you're gonna have to find out what you're made of. So, like any normal person, I decided to cross Alaska by myself in the dead of winter. <laughs> <laughs> and all I can say is thank God I got that out of my system. <laughs> and so what ended up happening is I thought, well, if you're going to cross Alaska, you better see if you have the metal for this. So I decided to go commercial fish up in Alaska. And I thought, if you're not tough enough to commercial fish, you're not tough enough to cross Alaska. So I go up there, walk in the docks of Kodiak Island, and I jumped in a boat called the Big Valley, and I'd actually watch it sink, and five crew members perish on a show called The Deadliest Catch about 12 years later, quite sadly. I knew the captain and one of the crew members. And when I was done with that, that portion of my test, I realized, okay, I'm ready, I can cross Alaska. So I went to Homer, Alaska, and I decided what I was gonna do was I was gonna ski down the frozen Yukon River. And I was gonna pull a little sled, a 160 pound sled behind me. I was gonna harness two dogs to my waist, and I'm gonna go down the river going from east to west. And so I happened to meet a neighbor named Jack Berry who was my dinner on dog sled racer. And I told him about my dream. He goes, well, I got two dogs. They're retired, but they can pull you across this state. So I started training with them for a few months, 15, 25 miles a day. And now it's about five days before I'm to leave, ready to go, got my equipment, got my camera from National Geographic, got my sled, got my polar suit. And Jack Berry comes up to me, he says, I don't think you can do it. In fact, I think you're gonna die before you make the first 100 miles. 
I'm taking the dogs back. Oh. And he thought, if I take the dogs, I'm certainly not going to go now because who's going to pull the sled? So I did the only thing I could possibly do at the time. I yelled at him. And I said, fine, I'll pull the sled myself. And five days later, at 55 below, I was pulling the sled by myself with all the dogs. Yeah. And I made the first 200 miles. And then when I got to my first little village on the frozen Yukon River, I, I could handle the cold, but the loneliness was really intense. I'm like, I need something other than myself to think about. And if I don't get a dog, I'm never going to make it. So I got a dog. And once I got a dog by the name of Diamond and attached him to my waist, my whole world changed. Because all of a sudden it was less about, this is so hard, this is so difficult, my feet hurt, I've got blisters. It was like, of course I've got to make it. What will happen if I don't make it? What's going to happen to my dog? Of course I've got to make it. Transformed everything. So this is an important piece. So now I'm skiing with Diamond down the frozen Yukon River. And very similar to what we're facing today, I look down and my heart goes into my throat. Because the only road that I know is melting ahead of schedule. The river is melting ahead of schedule. And I'm thinking... I have no other way to get across. What am I going to do? This isn't what I planned. And I realized I had two options, like we have right now. I give up, or I find a different way to continue, which is exactly where we are. So I stayed in the Athabascan native village. And while I was there, the Athabascans were kind enough to clean out a little tiny log cabin by the bank of the Yukon River. And I'm sitting there, and it's the magic of the life is, this is exactly what's going to, this is exactly what's happening to us right now. I'm walking in and out of my little cabin door going, I don't have another option. What do I do? I can't see how I'm going to continue on. Do I give up? Do I come back later, pick up where I stop? What do I do? As I'm going in and out of my door, this little snow bank is melting. And it's melting. This little green thing is sticking out. And it keeps sticking out more and more every day. So I, I dig it out, and I dig and pull out the last canoe built in this village 20 years before. <laughs> but it's dilapidated. And I think to myself, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build myself a canoe. So I go to all the elders and say, I'm going to build a canoe. But I need some tools. I'm building a canoe. I just need some tools. And word got back, no, 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 no. Women do not build canoes here. That's not what we do. So I had to go back to the elders and say, you don't understand where I come from in California. <laughs> That's what women do. We're canoe builders. <laughs> and they couldn't Google that back then. Otherwise, they would have fact checked me. And they would have found out I was exaggerating just a little bit. <laughs> and so then, what happened was I, I picked my three favorite Athabascans. We went out into the, the woods. I asked them what kind of trees, is it straight trees, as few limbs as possible, bark that goes up and down. I cut the three trees. I dragged them into the village. And now the elders are going, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. she's going to try to build this canoe. <laughs> so now they actually hire Herb, a, a big belly Athabasca missing a front tooth, to come have a fatherly talk with me. <laughs> we sit down the log, and he looks at me, and he says, we're looking over the river, waiting for it to break up. And he says, we... Uh, call you Wonder Woman <laughs> because of all the miles you can ski in a day. But you built this canoe and we're gonna call you Fruitcake. <laughs> so I ripped these 18 foot long planks of wood. I start hand planing five hours a day, five days a week, very meditative, right? And I'm sitting there and they're passing by and they're going, Fruitcake! You know, and the kids are emulating this. They're going, Fruitcake, you know? And this most amazing thing happened. There's two incredible decisive things that happened. The first one is very disturbing. Because as I'm hand playing, the children walked up to me and they said, what are you doing? And I looked at them and I said, I'm building a canoe. Like you guys have done for thousands of years. And I realized I was witnessing the break in the culture. The end of everything they knew. And I'm seeing that today in this society. And what that brings to you is dysfunctionality, a loss of connection, a loss of sense of place. It also brings addiction, depression, alcoholism. And the impacts of that in the end was as I was traveling down the Yukon River, always excited to see a little dot on the map to go to another Athabascan or Yupik Eskimo village. And when I'd get there, the village would not be there. All that would remain is the cemetery. This is what happens when you live in a dysfunctional society. And that's what we have going on right now. And it's the best opportunity we have to turn around and build an economy based upon restoration and healing. And when I talk to people out on the street campaigning, we weren't hungry for this three years ago. We're hungry for it today. So the other most amazing thing is, is I was making this, you know, hand planning and hand planning, and they're going, fruitcake, fruitcake. 
Well, we were having a great time. I'm doing that, and after two and a half weeks, I, you know, I submerged the planks of wood into the local muskrat pond, and I lay them at my feet. And again, I have the old canoe there, so that's my model. I know what I'm shooting for. And I start to assemble, and I see the most beautiful insight into our humanity. And this has had a huge impact on my leadership and this campaign. All of a sudden, they stop coming by going, fruitcake, and instead they come up and they say, I got a seat clap for that if you need a seat clap. And then someone else came by and said, I got some galvanized screws if you need some. And then someone else came by saying, I got some oil-based marine paint. You like blue and red. <sighs> this campaign is a canoe. And what I realized is you can talk all you want, you can make all the platitudes you want, but it's, you can make all the blueprints and plans that you want. But when people see you in the physical doing something, they want to help you build that boat, they want to get on that boat, and they want to go on the journey with you. That's how we function. I made the canoe in three and a half weeks. I paddled 900 miles in 11 days. I got done in four months, six days. Now, I, I, thought my, I thought my trip was over, and then two years later, I'm now 30, I picked up the search for my natural mother, and I'd find that she died about the time that I started to look for her when I was 11, she was 35. Her name was Jane Funston, and my name was Marcella Funston. And there's a Fort Funston and a Funston Avenue in San Francisco. My great-grandfather. That was my mother's grandfather. And at the, at the time of his death, he was the highest ranked military official in the country. He had Patton, Pershing, Dwight D. Eisenhower, MacArthur were under his command. He was overseeing Pershing as he even pursued Pancho Villa along the Mexican-American border. He dropped it of a heart attack and put the whole entire nation into shock. So he dies, and yet his actions, 100 years later, are continuing to impact people to this day. And here I am, his great granddaughter, and this is what's so amazing, is that when I did this trip, afterwards I find him two years later, and I find my mother died, I had a brother four and a half years younger than me, we're talking for the first time, I now know my name, I know my mother's name, and we're talking about my great grandfather, this general Frederick Funston, and when we're talking, he says to me, now when you crossed Alaska, that was after you found out our great grandfather did that, right? And I think to myself, you know, my brother's related to me, he might be a little crazy and has a story mixed up. I'm like, no, I said, I know, I said, I'm talking about Alaska. He goes, I know, I know. There's a May Smithsonian magazine article, May 89 edition, that talks about his life, talks about Alaska, and, I, and I'm thinking, you've got the story wrong. So I'm living in, by UCLA. This was 94 when the, 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 the internet wasn't going so much. In a half hour, I am in UCLA library. I have the magazine in my hand. My whole entire life is ready to go upside down. And I read that my great-grandfather had been hired by the USDA to go collect the botanical samples up in Alaska and find out what was up there. Well, he did not have the luxury to fly in like I did. So he had to have a two-year-long trip. And as I'm reading this in the magazine, I'm like, oh my god, that's so crazy. He started his trip on April 10th. That's my birthday. That's so crazy. And then I keep reading, oh look, he snowshoed down the frozen Yukon River. And along the way, he shot and killed a sled dog to eat because he was starving. I'm like, that's so crazy because I snowshoed down the frozen Yukon River. And I saved the sled dog from being shot and killed and used him as my companion. And then my great-grandfather with two buddies cut down three trees and built an 18-foot-long canoe. And I'm thinking, I cut down three trees and I built an 18-foot-long canoe. And then he paddled down the rest of the Yukon River, and when he got to the end of the trip towards the Bering Sea in the Delta, he flipped his canoe accidentally and lost a lot of photographs and botanical samples, not all but a lot. And when I built my canoe, I put little stabilizers on them, which absolutely saved me, like training wheels. He did his trip in 1894. I did my trip in 1994. He was 27, turned 28. I was 27, I turned 28. And he did his trip as 1,500 miles, and I was 1,500 miles. So I'm thinking, as I'm reading this, you can only imagine, I'm thinking to myself, this is mathematically impossible. This is mathematically impossible. And then I started to go into his life, and what I learned was legacy, and what we leave behind. And I started to realize he had no idea what he left behind. A lot of imperialism, a lot of white man's burden, a lot of our way or no way. And I realized, wow, we got a lot of cleaning up to do. And what in the world am I leaving behind? So now it is 2004, George Bush is reelected for a second time, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is horrific, and of course now that looks like the good old days. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what can I possibly do on one person? So I started looking into what's called peak oil and our oil addiction, and I hold a conference in 2005 called you know, the Peak Oil Conference, and we started an organization called Apple Alliance for a Post-Petroleum Local Economy, and it's all about resiliency and outreach, and, and, and I'm doing all this stuff to try to make us more resilient in case there's any kind of fuel shocks out there, which is pretty much what we're experiencing, and it's not very fun. 
and, and it's all about you know a local and regional economy, right? Mom and pop businesses and really boosting them up and networking more and having a really good fabric of community. And as I'm starting to interact with our city council, I realize they're all always reactive, not no, not proactive. And I'm like, hey guys, where are we going? Where are we gonna be in 20 years? And how are you measuring your leadership and the decisions you're making? Like, like what is the goal here? What's the goal? So I decided to run for city council. I got it in 2008. I became the vice mayor and the mayor. And I spent four years creating a sustainability vision. It's about 20 years of where do you want to be. I started the first organic farmer's market. I started the extreme weather shelter for the homeless. I started Sierra Roots, a homeless advocacy organization. We did a whole, all these retrofit green buildings to show people to have more energy efficient buildings. I just basically tried to build a canoe everywhere I went. Because I knew, I knew that if people could see it, they want to be part of it. And the main thing was I wanted to create the world that I wanted in my town. I couldn't change the world, but I wanted people to walk into my town and go, oh, this is what community's like. Oh, this is what a sense of, 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 of the community and a sense of place is like. Oh, this is fabulous. I want to go home and do the same thing. That's all I could do. So after four years, I thought I was done. And I was still highly engaged. I was still volunteering 2,000 hours a year, but I was not on the city council anymore. And then, as I'm still engaged and I'm working on um, farm to table events and creating a town square test pilot and stuff like that, this thing called the Trans-Pacific Partnership started to come along and threaten us, the TPP. And that was going to eviscerate local authority, that was going to eviscerate worker rights, uh, minimum wage, environmental regulation, all these different things. And I started to see this encroachment of, of corporations and government overreach, and I'm like, you know what? I think I'm going to jump back down the council because I want someone to have a backbone when these, these missiles start coming in. So I ran for re-election again in 2016. I got re-elected, and by that time, the whole entire world had changed. It was no longer being proactive. It was defense, defense, defense. Paradise burned down a few months later. We had 400 acres we owned. We had no way to actually clean out our forests. We have no money. We're a tiny little town. So I did a GoFundMe called a Goat Fund Me to go hire grazing goats. And that went absolutely international. I mean, Japan, Australia, England were reporting, oh my God, this town is, they're, they're turning to goats with the Goat Fund Me. Everybody just loved the whole entire thing. And then, of course, we had PG&E outages would last for days. Businesses would close. They'd never be able to reopen their, their doors once again. And then, of course, we had homeowners insurance policy cancellations, so people couldn't afford their homes. They couldn't afford their rents. Our people were, we were losing our renters. It was just this turmoil. And then, of course, I'm and COVID hits. And I started to see it in January. I was, not, I was very concerned about how the Chinese government was working. I'd never been concerned about anything like SARS, MERS, H1N1, but this was catching my attention. And I started talking to the county and the city, saying, hey guys, there's this thing called coronavirus, and um, it looks like it may not be that good, so maybe we should just kind of gear up and be ready for anything. And they're very slow into action, but I signed a declaration of emergency, Newsom did stay-at-home orders. I was very supportive, because at that point in time, it looked like the virulence was gonna be so bad that every five to 6.4 days, the number was gonna double, which by, by the end of April, the whole planet was gonna be consumed. I'm like, of all the times to be the mayor, and then the state home orders continue, and I'm now having Zoom calls with county officials, public officials, the county, cities, mayors, and, and city managers, and we're going out for predict predictive models, and then I'm like, this is fine. I'm good with this, until we get the real data, and the real data came in. And they did not adjust their cells one iota. And so I started to ask questions. Hey, guys, like, what's the goal here? Like, what's the end game? What's the metrics? What are we kind of shooting for here? And time after time, I'd ask these questions, and this is what would happen, is the CEO of the county would either mute me, yeah. ignore me, or tell me, Renette, you're asking too many questions, which was more than two. Wait till the end of the meeting, and we'll answer your, your, you know, your blades in the grass questions. And so finally, I got an answer from one of our doctors, and he said, Renette, um, you can expect more of this until we have zero cases. I said, zero cases? I said, when do we ever have zero cases of anything? And so now I'm really getting concerned, and now it's June, Newsom does a statewide mass mandate, and at that point in time, I'm like, wow, did not know a governor had that kind of authority, that's fascinating. So I went down to our police chief, and I said, Chad, do you plan on um, actually enforcing this mass mandate? And he said to me, I don't know how, There's, it doesn't come with a penal code. You can't enforce something without a penal code. And he goes, and by the way, it doesn't look very constitutional to me. I'm like, thank you very much. So I went back home and I grabbed a Peggy Hall, the Healthy American video. And I sat there for like a day or so. I kept watching for, you know, the backlash from all the elected officials and the leaders who know how this country works and how bills are made. And it was absolute silence. There was nobody. 
I'm like, where are the leaders? What in the world just happened? Where are the leaders? So I took the Peggy uh, Hall video. I did a nice explosive post like I've done before. I put on my Facebook page saying basically these mass mandates as you go about your day, no, Newsom does not have the authority, the unilateral power to do this, blah, 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 continue to breathe. And all hell broke out. Absolutely broke out. LA Times, SAC B, uh, SF Gate, Mayor says masks don't work. I'm like, that's not what I'm saying. Do not put words in my mouth. I'm talking about not the efficacy, I'm talking about the authority of the governor. Big difference. And this is a slippery, nasty slope. We're gonna go down if you keep allowing a governor to have this kind of power. Yeah. So at this point in time, I've just been elected for my third term, and I'm talking to my, my partner Susan, and we're watching what I would call COVID lives behind the scenes and lots of red flags, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my lord, I'm not going to be able to shut my mouth. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to shut my mouth. And what had happened is when I called out Newsom and his mask mandate, it all hell broke out in City Hall because my town's like, we love her, we hate her, we love her, we hate her. And the poor city staff are in the middle getting all the crosshairs, so you can imagine how exhausting that is and they can't get their job done. And so Susan, she's saying, are you going to be able to do this for another four years? I'm like, aye, aye, aye. I don't think so. So here it is, July 8th, I'm ready to step down as mayor, take my oath for the next four years, and instead I read my resignation letter. And when I did that, this is, the, this is the message I left from my city council members, and I'm very popular now. I said, there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Leonard Hardell, who's very well known for convincing the World Health Organization that Asian Orange is a cancer cause of aging. Once he did that, through empirical evidence and studies, he went to all the heads of the chemical companies and said, stop spraying. And you're committing a crime against humanity, and when they would not stop spraying, they dragged them into international courts, and they only had to ask one question, and one question only to determine whether or not they're committing a crime against humanity, and that question is, what did you know by when? Which we need to be asking every school board, every city council member, every county supervisor, every assembly, congressional, senator right now, what did you know by when? Because they've had enough public testimony, they've had enough information sent to them to know better. So I said to my city council, you're all committing crimes against humanity. And I'm going to come back, and I'm going to hold your feet to the fire to the highest extent of the law. I'm stepping down to step up, did not know what that really meant, and I said goodbye. And at that point in time, I was looking around asking, where are the virologists, where are the epidemiologists, where are the OSHA experts, where is everybody, why is everyone so silent? And so what most people don't know, because they don't tell us, is it's the job of the elected official to actually keep the public and the constituents informed. That's actually our job. That's what we're supposed not hide the information from you, but to actually keep you informed so you can actually make intelligent decisions. Yeah. So I did the only thing I could do, I thought, you know, I'm gonna start interviewing people. I had this incredible group of warrior mamas, and they're saying, okay, a lot of them are actually working for CHD, like Lynette. Interview Sherry Tenpenny, you got Christian Northrup, you got Ch uh, Peter McCauley, you got their, you know, uh, Andrew Co um, Cowan, or Tom Cowan, Andrew Kaufman, uh, Carrie Madey, um, Lee Dundas, David Martin, all these people. I started interviewing them, and when I first interviewed Sherry Tenpenny, I was on YouTube, Renette Senham's Chew on This, and it was the first time she, anyone ever spoke about the mechanisms of injury around the jab. That went viral, millions of views, and immediately YouTube took me right down without warning. I moved over to BitChute, continued the same thing, and I was on Del Big Trees, The High Wire. When that happened, I had some folks ask me to run, and one particular person was actually Graham Brownstein, who's on the board of the CHD California. Yeah. And he's like, run for governor. I'm like, absolutely, will never happen. <laughs> it's like, crazy. I am not going to do that. And then I kept waiting and waiting for the leaders, right? And I kept waiting and waiting for someone to come to the top and actually do what needed to be done. And I didn't see anything. And so I'm talking to my partner, Susan, again. And she's like, do you really want to do this? And I said, honey, I don't trust anyone as much as I trust myself. <laughs> So I went to Graham and said, look it, I said, this governor thing, I said, if you're willing to do a couple things, I'm willing to jump in, and these are the two requisites. The first one is no party affiliation because you can't serve the people in a party simultaneously. Yeah. Ever since the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United versus the FEC, yeah. basically representative government is completely dead in the water. Yeah. If you continue to vote for Republicans and Democrats, all you're gonna get from this point on is a, as a Newsom 2.0, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Please don't fool yourselves. Just like war, the big money has invested equally on both sides. So we've got to monkey wrench the system by no longer playing by their. 
It's the same story. It's the same outcome. So what we did is we actually read Newt Gingrich's contract with Americans, we read the rapper's uh, contract with black Americans, and we started working on a contract with Californians. And we did a beautiful Aikido move. We looked at the biggest threats facing California and we turned them into the biggest opportunities and solutions. We are now, we have a 30 page contract with Californians. It is a living document on my homepage. We have a second iteration. Don't know if I'm gonna get it up before the, the election, the primary, because we are on the road. And I believe in the collective genius. I've been tapping into that years as a, as a leader, an elected official, even with the canoe. I, I know so much, but collectively, we are absolutely, shiningly brilliant. Right. Yeah. And I believe in that. So we have this contract with Californians, and what we've done is we're building an economy based upon um, restoration and healing. We're using something called an infrastructure bank. We need a public bank in California. Did you know we have one? How many know, how many know about the infrastructure bank, the iBank? Exactly, California's dirty little secret. So it's a slush fund for politicians, essentially. They don't really use it. It's for infrastructure jobs, so $25 million jobs, $50 million jobs, but it's underutilized. Nobody knows about it. We don't have to go out there and create a whole new infrastructure bank. We use that incredible asset that we have. We bump up the cap so it's more than like $100 million, $200 million to start retrofitting all of our failing infrastructure. And then we actually expand it to include the mom and shop, mom and pop businesses that have shuttered over the last few years. Right, the Main Street businesses. And instead of getting the big banks 5 to 8% interest, we actually print our own dollars and we do it at a quarter percent interest. And we keep the money in California and we improve what's that called that economic multiplier effect, right? Keep that dollar swirling around in your local economies. Then what we do is we start working on regenerative farming and we expand it. By rebuilding our topsoil, we, set, we actually solve about 80% of our environmental climate change problems. Whoa. Not only are you taking care of, of the problems of water, we have a water allocation problem. We are being robbed blind by our water. There's a water war, land war going on right now, and it is really ugly. We've been talking to the farmers. But what we do is when you rebuild your topsoil, what's currently happening when it rains, the majority of the water goes off the dirt like it's a plate into the waterways and right into the Pacific Ocean. If you actually rebuild your topsoil, it acts like a sponge, and you actually refill all those dying aquifers. Then what you do is you make sure that we actually have a pollinator population because we need food. And then the other thing we do is we actually make sure we have our legacy farms and ranchers. Actually, we make sure they're in place for generations to come and we expand that as well. And then the other thing we do is we actually build back a common sense education system. Which means that we're actually making better humans rather than having these people who've been completely desensitized and dumbed down from the indoctr indoctrination camp they've all been having to go through for years. I want to see children actually come out of school a better human. Yeah. I want them to critically think. Yeah. I want them to question authority. Yeah, right. I want them to know how to use their hands to make things, to build things, to yeah. fix things. Yeah. I want them to know how to do wiring, how to do construction, how to fix you know, uh, engines and so on. We have absolutely been disabled to this point of why we have people who are no longer feeling like they're a part of anything and they matter because the education system, the social media, the media has trained them to be that way. Yeah. And if there's anything I can ever mandate, which I don't want to mandate anything, I'll incentivize, but I'm done with mandates, is if I could, I'd take every single nursing home and require them to back up behind every single elementary school where they have to share the same playground. Yeah. That would be the best thing. So we have this beautiful document. I just want to let you guys all know that this COVID is dark and difficult as bent. We've lost lots of friends, lots of relatives, like oh, everyone here, who is not? The conversation I'm having right now, we're traveling up and down the state of California. If I had three years ago said we want to build an economy based upon restoration and healing, people would have absolutely gone cross-eyed. And we talk about this now, whether they're extreme right, extreme left, doesn't matter, in the city, urban, rural areas, everyone says, thank God, it's time. The top three things we're hearing from people is just get rid of Newsom. We don't care. Just get rid of him. The next thing they do is they ask, what's your party affiliation? We said none whatsoever. And the response across the board is, thank God. And the last thing is, we just want solutions. I go, that's great, because I'm a solutionarian. So we had to get to these dark times. And we're all hearing the call. We all know we have to do something. And the one thing I've, I've learned, I'm gonna wrap this up here in just a minute, is that people in their hearts know 
the ones who haven't really admitted what's going on, they, they know they're on a sinking Titanic. They can sense it, even if they don't want to admit it. That's not our job, and I had people many, many years ago when I started the whole resiliency sustainability in Nevada City say, Renette, how are you gonna convince people to go sustainable? And I was like, I'm not convincing anyone to go sustainable. We're just gonna have to be ready when we have no other option. So the objective is not to convince people whether they're right or wrong. The objective is to actually dock up next to that sinking Titanic and show them the life raft. <laughs> show them the canoe. And they're gonna jump in and they're gonna go with you. We set the example. We're the model. They're hungry for it. So this is the most amazing time to be alive. This is the best opportunity we've ever had to actually bring balance to our, our planet and make it bountiful once again, and a guarantee for generation after generation. And there's this beautiful quote, I'm gonna end with this, that I came across, which is so true, which is man has never been able to invent a material as strong as the human spirit. And that's what we have. Thank you. Everybody. She's um, Renette's campaign manager, and uh, she's going to just give us a little bit of uh, information how we can support and make this happen. So uh, please hang around. There's more after Melissa. Fun. How's it going, everybody? What do you say about Renette Sandin for California governor? My name is Melissa Grace. I am honored to stand shoulder to shoulder with Renette and Susan in this uh, Herculean effort to turn California around. I think that y'all, I mean, I was watching everyone, uh, some people crying when Renette was speaking, and I think that she is the only political figure and leadership that I've ever seen that people come up to her afterwards and say, oh my God, I love your energy. They're not saying that about Newsom. <laughs> Now, I, I'm familiar with every single candidate on the gubernatorial ticket for the primaries. No one has what Renette, take, what, what Renette has. No one has what it takes to go up against Newsom and present a cultural shift in California. No one. And so, raise your hand if you realize how serious this primary election is for the future of California. Yeah. I mean, that's everybody, right? What ha tends to happen is that the most extreme on the left and right vote in the primaries. So we're at, we end up with two candidates in the general election that most people don't participate in. How many of you know when the primary election is? June 7th. Ballots go out May 9th. They are being mailed to every registered voter in California. We are asking you, pleading with you, do not mail your ballot in. Hold on to it. Find out where your local polling place is. If you guys are not registered to vote yet, I mean, come on, we gotta make sure you register to vote first. Show up to your local polling place June 7th and vote in person. Do not give any further thought to uh, contributing to the problems with election integrity. Yeah. So this is a campaign built around miracles and favors. What I do in San Diego, I'm, I'm the founder of an organization called San Diego Rise Up. Thank you so much. We have been focusing on building community. And what you guys are all a part of here with Marin Freedom Rising is incredible. This is what it's going to take for us to build strong models in individual counties, 58 counties up and down California, with somebody like Renette as governor. And we truly have an opportunity to build the momentum to affect the change that we need in this state. So I wanna know who here is ready to commit to changing California? Because this campaign, without party fundraising, without big, big, doning, big donor money, this is about returning power back to the people and we need your help. So if there's anyone here that can commit right now to fundraising, to helping us contribute to this campaign, we need help. This truly is, an opportunity for the people to return power back to the people for California. Woo! 
And so if not now, then when? And if not us, then who? So no contribution is too small. We, we honestly need to raise, raise $75,000 in the next three weeks. So it's not just about financial contributions. We do need that. We also need, every single one of you has magic to offer in a variety of ways. It's not just financial. So is there anybody here that can make a financial contribution today? Raise your hand. We've got some amazing, keep your hands up. We've got some amazing volunteers that are gonna come and give you an envelope. Keep your hands up, thank you so much. If you guys are, keep your hands up. I am so impressed and inspired by the energy that we've been experiencing up and down the state of California the last couple of weeks, actually, to be honest, the last couple of years. While COVID has been a deep grieving process for many, it has also been the greatest opportunity for us to shine and rise together as we were always intended to do. COVID was just a symptom of a dysfunctional society and we as people have an opportunity right now to change the trajectory. I hope that you guys feel the incredible opportunity of this moment. I'm enthusiastic, I'm biased, obviously. I love Renette, my dad introduced us five years ago, but I trust Renette implicitly. I trust her leadership, I trust who she is as a person, she's principled, and I know that we are going to get through this primary and give Gavin Newsom a run for his money. So I'm gonna be hanging out at that table over there. We've got all kinds of postcards and buttons and stickers and all kinds of yard signs, yard signs, yard signs. Take them with you. We appreciate your contributions. We appreciate your contributions to this community and to California at large. We're gonna do this thing. Yeah, any, that's a great idea. Anybody that is donating, please come to the front. Let's take a picture with Renette. And then, and then we'll do a big group photo next time.